My name is Rick Saul. I, I teach international politics at Queen Mary, just down the road, and I'll be chairing tonight's session. Um, Toby's going to talk for about 50 minutes. Um, I've been instructed to ask all of you uh, that have mobile devices to turn them off or to turn them to silent now. Um, some of you may know, may know Toby um, from his many media appearances, or you're a student of Toby, but for those of you who don't know Toby, or as I should formally announce him, Professor Toby Dodge, the Kuwait professor uh, and director of the, of the LSE's Middle East Centre, and a professor in the International Relations Department here at the LSE. Toby is also a senior consulting fellow for the Middle East at the Inter International Institute for Strategic Studies. His research concentrates on the evolution of the post-colonial state and in, in the international system, with the main focus, obviously, on the Middle East, and in particular, Iraq. And um, I know he's got uh, some interesting people in his sort of file of facts of diary entries, David Petraeus and, 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 and many others that he may make uh, reference to uh, today's lecture. So he's going to talk for 50 minutes, and we have plenty of time for, for Q&A, and uh, I'll run through the, you know, the protocol for Q&A uh, at the time. So over to you, Toby. OK, well, thank you for all, uh, everyone for turning out in such large numbers. It's, it's nice to see a big audience. Uh, it raises the bar, so hopefully I can get over that. But especially thank you to my friend and former colleague and indeed expert himself on US foreign policy, uh, Rick Saul, for agreeing to chair this event. And of course, like all good academics, I want to get my excuses in first. Yeah? So first, if we were looking at history, the history of the Trump administration, I think it's been moving especially quickly in Washington, D.C., and I don't want to be outflanked by its marching legions. So let's focus on this picture for a moment that was taken 10 months ago in, uh, at the very early days of Trump, uh, Trump's term. It shows President Trump himself, Vice President Mike Pence sitting in the Oval Office with the then National Security Advisor Mike Flynn, uh, Priebus, the Chief of Staff, the White House Pr Press Secretary and Acting uh, White House Communications Director Sean Spicer, and its Chief Strategist Steve Bannon. Flynn was fired, as we know, in February 2017 for repeatedly lying to the Vice President about his Russian and now it turns out Turkish contacts. Sean Spicer, apart from being a figure of mirth on um, Saturday Night Live, was sacked in July 2017 and replaced by the wonderful Anthony Scaramucci, who was removed from his post after being in the job only 10 days. In July, Chief of Staff Priebus was also sacked and Steve Bannon left on the 18th of August. James Comey, the FBI director, was sacked in May. It was proving a little bit difficult to keep up. And so from this picture, only the president and the vice president remain. And if we were looking at the press coverage over the last couple of days, uh, uh, the president and secretary of state boasting about their intellectual prowess, one wonders how long Rex Tillotson can remain in his job. Secondly, and I think more seriously uh, for the academics and those smart people amongst you studying foreign policy analysis at the master's level, secondly, the Trump administration poses an analytical problem for academics working within the discipline of foreign policy analysis because of its incoherence. The president's personality clearly dominates the government in an unpredictable and uninstitutionalized way. His early morning communications via Twitter represent an unmediated stream of consciousness which frequently undermines, if not totally destroys, official policy and the statements of his senior staff. This has given rise to competing analytical conclusions about the direction of Trump's foreign policy, with a new consensus emerging, especially after the appointment of the retired four-star Marine General John Kelly as White House Chief of Staff on the 31st of July, and then the subsequent sacking of Steve Bannon two weeks later. So what I'm arguing here is that we may be in a, a consolidation period where the, 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 the direction and the drivers of the Trump administration may be more visible. Now, this has given rise to a, 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 a new consensus, maybe personified by Elliot Abrahams, who we must remember was rejected by Trump to serve as the Deputy Secretary of State for the Middle East. Now, he argues, quote, it is already clear that this is not a revolutionary administration. The broad lines of its policy fit easily within the, within the last few decades. Trump might not be a conventional president, 
But so far, here's the killer line, his foreign policy has been remarkable, remarkably unremarkable. Now, Gregory Gorse, a professor at A&M who may well be known to you, writes very well on the international relations of the Middle East, argues, quote, with, very one, Im with one very important exception, and despite a number of rhetorical and stylistic differences, the Trump administration's approach to the Middle East is not substantially different from that of the Obama administration. And Mark Lynch says something similar. What I would want to argue is I'd want to disagree with this analysis. I think a close examination of both the ideology sh shaping White House decision making and, more importantly for tonight, its application to the Middle East shows the profound difference of this administration from its predecessors, but also, more importantly, the instability that has directly flowed from these differences and may well increase. So what I'm going to try and do tonight is take you through my argument in a game of two halves. Firstly, I want to make this argument by looking at the incoherence, but then the ideology and the militarization of the Trump administration. These are my big, three big driving themes. And then I want to see, depending on the tolerance of the chair and how quickly I speak, if I can lay this out in, po in Trump's policy, firstly towards the states of what used to be called the Gulf Cooperation Council, then Iran, then the fight against the Islamic State, and then policy towards Syria. I want to conclude by speculating in a rather bold and somewhat unhinged way about what Trump's foreign policy says more generally about America's go global decline and place in the world. So first, let's look at the undeniability, the incoherence of Trump's uh, foreign policy. So the White House under Trump is a workplace where job duties remain unclear, morale amongst a lot of the junior and mid-ranking staff is low, and factionalism and division is still high. Visitors to the White House are struck by how tired the staff look and with the outflow of senior managers who can blame them. This is firstly because of Trump's own style of management. Trump has become increasingly vexed by the challenges and the scale of the government he's now in charge of. The new president's allies say he's been surprised that government can't be run like his own business in a top-down, highly personalized way. He's growing increasingly frustrated that the complexities of running this massive federal bureaucracy elude him. He can't get hold of it. And Trump's lack of interest in, in the details of public policy has prevented him from translating his campaigning slogans into anything approaching a concrete policy. Instead, he has shown something that you could argue amounts to almost complete flexibility. On issue after issue, he's changed his mind and he's contra contradicted or ditched previous policy. Trump's use of Twitter has outflanked his aides, heads of department, and indeed whole government institutions. These sporadic treats, off the tweets, off-the-cuff remarks at campaign style rallies and press conference diatribes are nonetheless critical communications because they speak of the administration's intent and its possible future behavior. Whether tweets like the presidential directive by tweet on transsexual serving in uniform are official is somewhat beside the point. His inability to maintain on any issue a consistent or even coherent position has undercut, crucially, I think, as we'll see over the next few weeks on Iran policy, his ability to build coalitions in Congress and therefore get laws passed. On foreign policy, I would argue, he's made no sustained attempt to articulate a doctrine or even delineate a worldview. On trade, he's made no comprehensible case for an American retrenchment from the global economy beyond his assertion, uh, an assertion, as we'll see in a minute, long-running, that other countries are taking advantage of the US. Now, this time, the time it took for him to assemble an administration and then this rapid turnover in senior staff represents a deeper rift between Trump and the Washington establishment of both parties, but in his case, much more importantly, the rift between him and the establishment of the Republican Party. A reality show businessman with no government experience, Mr. Trump was catapulted into power on the promise of breaking up the existing system. Now, a new president 
typically needs to make 4,000 appointments. But with no coherent group of followers or allies, or with past political service to call on, he's had to start almost from scratch. During President Trump's transition to power, numerous front bench or reserve bench American foreign policy experts were rejected from posts in the new administration. The reason was consistent. They'd all said disparaging things about Trump during the campaign who had signed these letters opposing him. Many Republicans further down the kind of pecking order may have agreed to work for the president but were put off by, his retro by the racist rhetoric he used during the campaign and his erratic behavior since. For, the, for Trump, the challenge is more pronounced because he and his advisors feel they simply cannot trust the senior cadre of career professionals still working in the White House, the National Security and the uh, National Security Council and the Cabinet. And this stream of leaks clearly coming from holdovers uh, or civil servants has exacerbated that. Now, if this wasn't bad enough, the Russian scandal has sucked oxygen out of the White House and the National Security Council. And then to, you have Flynn's resignation. Then on the, fifth, in, on the 15th of May, it was leaked that Trump had discussed highly secret information with the Russians that, provide, that were provided by an intelligence ally of the United States about the Islamic State. And then finally, to add it all, Trump sacked James Comey, the FBI director, triggering this wide-ranging investigation, and now the, the grand jury that hangs over the administration like a potential sword of Damocles. However, beyond all that that I've laid out, beyond this supposed chaos, beyond the problem of the Russian administration, beyond the in and out of, of administration staffers, I think there are, we can identify three coherent ideological trends shaping administration policy. Now, obviously, crucial to the policy, this process is Trump himself. Now, Trump may be an egotist. He more, certainly is a narcissist, but he's also been remarkably consistent. A close examination of all his public speeches and interviews since he first became a public figure in the New York real estate uh, market in the early 1980s shows constant trends. Trump has delivered the same message for over 40 years. His worldview is zero sum. Another country's benefit comes at America's extent. He sees life to a certain extent as combat. Insofar as he plays, pays attention to military and security affairs, his main concern has been consistently that he believes the United States has been ripped off by allies who are free riding on America's protection and that the American standard of living has declined because comparatively fewer resources were available for consumption. Now, if you don't believe me, I take you back to 1987 when, when Trump was flirting with a presidential uh, run. He spent uh, $95,000 to publish a full-page open letter in three newspapers. He argued in 1987, quote, the world is laughing at American politicians as we protect ships we don't own, carry oil we don't need, destined for allies who won't help. <coughs> End of quote. He focused his critique on affluent states like Japan, this is during the uh, first Gulf War, which, had, which he argued had leaped to the forefront of world economies on the back of American generosity. Now, today, the target of his, of his uh, uh, accusations has shifted to China, uh, but the argument is still the same. Hence, Trump overtly rejects the international liberal order that shaped international relations since 1945 and America's role at its center. Trump does not believe in an open trading regime. He does not care about the spread of democracy or the promotion of uh, human rights abroad. He's not invested in institutions of cooperative security that have been the basis of global peace since the end of the Second World War. So unlike Trump's belief about trade, Trump's beliefs about immigration and his, race, his adoption of a racist rhetoric during the election campaign can be identified as starting around 2011, and that may mean they're pr pragmatic. He became an anti-immigrant populist to be able to mobilize Republican voters better than his, his competitors for the presidential nomination. Now, beyond Trump's own personal beliefs, 
His attacks on multiculturalism, liberalism, and internationalism draw on a distinct, coherent narrative of US history that Walter Russell Mead, as we probably all know, has labeled Jacksonian coming from Andrew Jackson. So for Jacksonians who form the core, Mead argues, Russell Mead argues, of Trump's electoral base, the, uh, the United States is not a political entity created and defined by a set of intellectual propositions rooted in the Enlightenment or some universal mission. Rather, it's simply a nation state of American people and its chief business lies at home. We then have the next man down, who I think till he was sacked was the most intellectually interesting of those that came to shape uh, um, Trump's foreign policy. Bannon, Steve Bannon came to run Trump's election campaign from running the right-wing website Breitbart News. He supplied Trump with an off-the-shelf, almost fully formed, internally coherent worldview that accommodated Trump's own feelings about trade and foreign threats that Trump eventually dubbed American first nationalism. Everywhere Bannon looked in the modern world, he saw signs of collapse, an encroaching globalist order stamping out the last vestiges of what he saw as American traditional society. Bannon saw evidence of Western collapse and influx of Muslim refugees and migrants across Europe and the United States, what he termed, quote, a civilizational jihad personified by this migrant crisis, end of quote. Bannon's response was to a set of populist, right-wing nationalist policies to build a bulwark against what he sought, saw as a destructive modernity. Wherever he could, he aligned himself with politicians and causes that committed to tearing down what he saw as a globalist edifice. Finally, just days before he was sacked, Bannon argued in an inter interview, quote, that the economic war with China is everything, and we have to maniacally focus on that. If we continue to lose it, we've got five years. I think 10 years at most of hitting an inflection point or we'll never be able to recover. So if we have Trump as this kind of manic uh, reality show businessman, we then have Bannon as an extreme conservative uh, um, ideologue. Finally, we have H.R. McMaster. The, the, the final ideological trend is represented by the so-called, quote, axis of adults senior figures that Trump has so heavily relied on, centrally Gen Lieutenant General H.R. McMaster, the National Security Advisor. Now, on one hand, McMaster is a career soldier, has spent the majority of his life in the military, involved in multilateral coalitions, first fighting the 1991 Gulf War, then serving under David Petraeus from 2007 onwards in both Iraq and Afghanistan. Oh, someone that we can rely on. However, at the end of May 2007, he published an op-ed uh, in the Wall Street Journal, America First Doesn't Mean America Alone, where he attempted to define the administration's foreign policy. This critiqued the Obama administration and argued that the Trump administration was working hard to restore confidence in American leadership. Okay, good news. However, it went on to push American allies to, quote, share equitably the responsibility for our mutual defense. And finally, the payoff argument controversially was, quote, the world is not a global community, but an arena where nations, non-governmental actors, and businesses engage and compete in advantage. Now, this is a really important quote. Clearly, uh, he, he was attempting to channel Trump's own world views codify them and consolidate them. But it was clearly placing a limit on America's commitment to, a glo to global leadership where all alliances are formed to directly benefit the US to be self-seeking and hence ultimately temporary. McMaster was certainly channeling the views of his boss, but the vision that he laid out was one, if enacted, that would place firm limits on America's commitment to delivering world order prioritizing transactional short-term relationships where shifting alliances are temporarily created to suit America's needs. And I'll get to the Gulf in a minute where I think we see this playing out. We then go to the militarization of um, 
of kind of Trump's foreign policy decision-making machine. So not only H.R. McMaster, but James Mattis, Secretary of Defense, is a retired Marine general. John Kelly, the comparatively new White House Chief of Staff, was also a Marine general. Now, there were clearly instrumental reasons for this dominance of the military. Serving soldiers find it very difficult, if not impossible, to refuse a president who asked to work for them. They thus form a ready pool of senior staff into which Trump can, uh, can dip, can take people from, because he hasn't got this bench of Republican stalwarts. However, there, it, it, this, it clearly represents a militarization of foreign policy as a deliberate presidential aim. In February 2017, Trump claimed that the budget he sent to Congress contains one of the largest defense spending increases in history. And later, he handed a series of new wartime authorities to the Pentagon. In conjunction with that, he also proposed a cut of 30% to the State Department, a push to eliminate some 2,300 jobs. This is combined with vacancies for many senior uh, State Department posts in the summer, at least, including 20 of 22 assistant secretary positions requiring Senate confirmation. Unfulfilled ambassadors are roughly standing at 30% of the total of American ambassadors. So to sum up this point, we have an American administration which is certainly dysfunctional with a president famed for his inconsistency. However, the administration is also driven by three major ideological influences. We have a president who's long been convinced that the US has been exploited by free-riding states who have benefited from its American largesse without contributing themselves. This president also believes that the terms of international trade have been unfairly fixed to disadvantage the US. He has a much lighter commitment to US role in underpinning the stability of the international system. We then have Steve Bannon, who gave Trump his ideological coherence and solidified the electoral base that delivered him to the White House by focusing on white nationalism, anti-immigration, and strong borders. Bannon was overtly hostile to a globalist agenda of multilateralism. And finally, we have H.R. McMaster, who stressed this realist assertion that America's role in the world is driven by maximizing its own interests to the exclusion of others and downplaying long-term costly multilateral uh, alignments, alliances. So finally, after all that, we get to the Middle East. Against this background, President Trump made his first major foreign policy trip to the Middle East, and specifically to Saudi Arabia in late May 2017. I think we should start by focusing on the incoherence of policymaking in the Trump administration ahead of that visit. When the, trip to, when the trip to Riyadh was confirmed, the Saudi government took the initiative, interesting in itself, and sent three sets of PowerPoint briefing packs to the US government outlining what they wanted from a renewed strategic partnership with America. This was large-scale weapons uh, sales, but transactionally, in return, they offered increased Saudi investment in the United States. But most important of all, what Riyadh wanted from Washington and from Trump's visit to Riyadh was a new US-Saudi partnership in the Gulf, itself overtly focused on containing Iran. Now, my own research suggests that the National Security Council, after this briefing pa these briefing packs arrived, met three times at the principal level, that Secretary of State, Secretary of Defense, and the National Security Advisor, in the run-up to the trip in an attempt to agree a coherent consensus-based strategy on this third issue around this new renewed alliance towards Iran, but uh, against Iran, but failed to come up with a response which had been stress-tested, one in which the long-term ramifications of this new alliance had been worked out. Trump then delivered his first major speech on US policy towards the Middle East in Riyadh on the 21st of May. All the big themes of the Trump administration's approach to international relations were clearly spelled out in that speech. America first, militarization, and the transactional basis to diplomacy. Now let's look at the transactional relationship with the GCC first. 
In Trump's speech in Riyadh, he announced, yesterday we have signed historic agreements with the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia that will invest $400 billion in our two countries. This landmark agreement includes the announcement of 110 billion Saudi-funded defense purchases. They invest in our country, we give them all the weapons they need. Now, intriguingly, before meeting Tamim, the Emir of Qatar, the next day, Trump added, one of the beautiful, no, one of the things that we will discuss is the purchase of lots of beautiful military equipment because no one makes it like the United States. <laughs> the second big theme is a complete indifference to state society relations in the countries of the Gulf Cooperation Council. To quote Trump again, we are not here to lecture. We are not here to tell others how people, other people how to live, what to do, who to be, or how to worship. Instead, we are here to offer partnership based on shared interests and shared values. We seek partners, not perfection, in our allies who share our goals. Trump went on to meet King Hamid of Bahrain, a country that, is a, got a, that is profound, profoundly divided and has a dreadful human rights record. And he says, quote, there has been a little strain between the US and Bahrain, but there won't be any strain with this administration. He then gave his backing to a Saudi-led, US-backed coalition against Iran. Again, to quote, until the Iranian regime is willing to be a partner for peace, all nations of conscience must work together to isolate Iran, deny it funding for terrorism, and pray for the day when the Iranian people have a just and righteous government that they deserve. End of quote. Now, in case you missed it, that was a call for regime change. One of the primary goals of Trump's trip was to solidify the emerging alignment between Israel and the Arab states of the Gulf against Iran. After a meeting with the Israeli president, Trump suggested that the Arab states like Saudi Arabia were readier to make peace with Israel because of their shared antipathy with Iran. Now, Trump not only gave his blessing, on my reading of that speech, to a regional Cold War, but to a struggle that will undoubtedly exacerbate sectarian tensions. It would also reduce the, the ability of individual Gulf cooperation states to develop a more balanced relationship with Iran. The smaller states of the GCC, Kuwait, Oman, Qatar, that I'll get to in a minute, will have to will be forced or feel pressured to align with the more aggressive policies of Saudi Arabia and the United Arab Emirates. The result will be increased instability and, excel and, and I would argue, in retaliation, accelerated Iranian interference in the GCC states. However, the dispute with Gata was the most damaging short-term outcome of Trump's trip to the region. Against this background, given the inconsistent messaging from the Trump administration, it is not unreasonable to assume that the Saudi and Emirati leaders thought they'd been given at least a tacit green light from the new president to escalate their conflict with Gata. Early on in the crisis, on the 5th of June, Secretary of State Tillerson appealed for reconciliation. The blockade, he argued, was, quote, impairing the US and other international business activities. Barely an hour later, after his Secretary of State had appealed for moderation, uh, Trump called Gata, quote, a funder of terrorism at a very high level. Trump bucked convention and the advice of his own government by contradicting his Secretary of State and labeling Gata a state sponsor of terrorism. He also undermined the coherence of the US government backing the idea, um, uh, backing away from the proposals that put forward by Mattis and Tillotson. Now, if you're sitting in Abu Dhabi or Riyadh and you're, you're pushing a very aggressive policy to bring Gata into line, who are you going to listen to? The Secretary of Defense, the Secretary of State, who are both arguing moderation and negotiation, or the President, who's calling your enemies state sponsors of terrorism. So Trump's penchant, Trump for off-the-cuff remarks and tweets has certainly complicated the resolution of this issue. When Tillotson finally visited the Gulf, almost two months after the crisis began, unsurprisingly, he returned empty-handed. 
in no small part because Riyadh and Abu Dhabi saw no reason to sign up to his mediation plan when they could outflank him, go straight to Trump, and almost certainly get the answers they wanted. This shows just how destabilizing transactional foreign policy can be when married with a US government by tweet and the deinstitutionalization of policymaking at the highest level in Washington. Now, I think we then go on to policy towards Iran, which is, if anything, more destabilizing than policy towards the GCC. Now, General Mattis and McMaster spent their formative years in senior combat roles in Iraq after 2003, before the US drawdown in 2011. This means, basically, they're in direct competition for influence in the country with the Iranian general Qasem Soleimani and the forces of the Quds Brigade of the Revolutionary Guard. They personally feel that they've lost a lot of American soldiers under their command as a direct result of Iranian actions in Iraq and passive responses by the Obama administration. I would gently suggest this doesn't lead to dispassionate foreign policy making. In August 2010, shortly after taking control of Central Command, Mattis was asked by President Obama what he thought the top three threats in his region of responsibility, which stretches, let us not forget, from Egypt to the former Soviet Republic of Kazakhstan and includes active war zones in Iraq, Syria, and Afghanistan. His response to Obama's question was, quote, number one, Iran. Number two, Iran. Number three, Iran. As the head of CENTCOM, Mattis proposed a radical escalation and expansion of the conflict via direct strikes inside Iran. The Obama administration, possibly unsurprisingly, removed him as CENTCOM commander five months early, in part because of the pre president's disapproval of his proposal to escalate the conflict. Now, in his own remarks in Riyadh, Trump signaled his intention to end engagement with Iran, suggesting that it does not encourage change inside the country. Trump's speech to the United Nations General Assembly on the 19th of September went on to call the nuclear, nuclear accord with Iran, the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action, quote, one of the worst, most one-sided transactions the US has ever entered into. Quite frankly, he said, it's an embarrassment. Secretary of State, Tillotson on the margins of the General Assembly, General Assembly said the US wanted to, quote, revisit what he described as the flaws in the accord, even as he acknowledged Iran was abiding by its terms. Now, a 2015 law sponsored by two senators, the Democrat Cardin and, and, and the Republican Corker, dictates that the US president must recertify every 90 days as to whether Iran is in compliance with the JCPOA's terms, but also whether, it is in, it, it, whether the agreement is in, um, uh, supports the national security interests of the United States. Now, as we know, Trump recertified in April and then again in July. He must do so again in four days' time on the 15th of October. And I'm, the marching legions of history are out thanking me as I speak because he's going to give a major policy, policy speech on Iran tomorrow. So within 24 hours, you'll know whether the, what I'm just about to say is right or not. <laughs> if he doesn't recertify, the matter goes to Congress, which would have uh, 60 days to vote by a simple majority, 51, um, on whether to reimpose sanctions. So a policy announcement is scheduled for tomorrow. Yet again, it seems that Trump's own administration has been divided about how to proceed against Iran. Tillotson would, uh, was, would, uh, has been arguing that to tear up the agreement would alienate allies and simply empower Iran to re start reproducing nuclear fuel. Secretary of Defense Mattis, to add to the complexity of this, affirmed during a Senate Armed Services Committee on the 3rd of October, during a hearing, that staying in the JCPOA was in US national interest. Appearing alongside him, Joe Dunford, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, said the agreement had delayed the development of nuclear capacity by Iran. However, the new White House strategy appears to want to decertify the agreement without pushing Congress to abandon it through reimposing sanctions. So Trump. Wants, not, wants to say that the agreement 
isn't in US vital national interests, but then he doesn't want the Congress to vote new, the reimposition of sanctions, if you can get your head around that. This camp, uh, at, the, uh, at the center of this, H.R. McMaster plans to reassure congressional Republicans, virtually all of whom oppose the deal, that, that this will herald a new campaign against Iran. This campaign is at the center of McMaster's Iran policy review due to be delivered to an unsuspecting public in October. The new policy is expected to target Iranian-backed militias, including Hezbollah, and the finances that facilitate them. It is also alleged to want to designate the Iranian Revolutionary Guard Corps as a terrorist organization for the, fir uh, for the first time. Now, what will this do? I think, again, Trump is reckless in his policy and fueling instability. There's no certainty that Congress won't simply reimpose sanctions, thus breaking the deal. There's also no certainty that Iran won't respond. So that will respond if, if, if sanctions are reimposed by walking away from the deal, thus further destabilizing. So the ramifications, I would argue, are more sanctions on Iran, greater military tension in the Gulf, especially around the Straits of Hormuz, the freezing, if not the outright failure of the Iran nuclear deal, without any indication that the United States has a clear political or military strategy for mediating the risks and the threats involved in that. Now, those are the big two points, I think. Policy towards the Gulf Cooperation Council and policy towards Iran. I'll jump through quickly policy towards the Islamic State and policy towards Syria. And I can do it quickly because uh, Mattis himself and the Pentagon took over policy towards the Islamic State despite Trump's campaign rhetoric they decided that the Obama administration's policy was working and they'll continue it. But after the fall of Mosul, with the Islamic State's defeat in Raqqa, nearly uh, they control only 20% of the city, there has been no consideration beyond the military defeat of the Islamic State about dealing with the political causes behind that, either in Iraq, which would be much more straightforward or in Syria. It's very reminiscent of 2007 when the Bush administration led, launched a military surge against the Iraqi civil war and the key protagonists, but didn't ever quite get round to dealing with the political causes underpinning that civil war. Pulled out in 2011, and we see the fall of Mosul in 2014. So they've, through a very rough and ready uh, military policy of air power and allies on the ground. They've delivered a military victory, but they haven't in any way dealt with the causes, which I suspect means we're destined for greater instability both in Syria and Iraq, which brings us towards the policy in Syria. Surprisingly, there was increased military action in early April with the launching of 59 Tomahawk cruise missiles uh, against a Syrian air base in retaliation for the use of chemical weapons. Nikki Haley, the US ambassador to the United Nations, has cast doubt on Assad's legitimacy as Syria's leader. Haley, is a, um, Haley had said that, that the unrest in Syria or the instability cannot uh, end while Assad remains in power. But against the background of a, an increased Iranian and Russian commitment to keeping Assad in power, there's no clear policy about what the United States does to remove Assad, what the United States does to, 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 to bring peace to Syria. Again, you've got rhetorical flourishes, but no central policy. So let me conclude about all this. I think what we've done, I hopefully, is outlined what drives Trump's foreign policy. We've outlined its instability, it, the instability it's caused both from tomorrow onwards in Gulf, or Arab Gulf states' relations with Iran, but much more widely, Iran's relationship with the international community. We've outlined what this transactional policy does for the relationship, intra-state relationship with the GCC between Gatto and the rest of them, but also Trump's relationship with key states like Saudi Arabia and the United Arab Emirates. But we haven't touched on why. What does Trump represent? And I think the rise of Trump needs to be understood against the background of the global fi financial and economic crisis of 2007 and 8, but also conceptions of America's global economic decline. 
Now, the United States clearly remains the richest and most powerful country in the world, but its margins of preeminence have undoubtedly reduced. China's GNP is now larger than the United States, and America's share of global industrial production has fallen to less than 20%. There is a persistently large deficit in the country's trade balance. The widely held perception of a coming structural change in the world balance of economic and military power amongst the US public at large explains the appeal of, Ameri of, of, of America first, this, this Trump electoral so slogan. The US is no longer an unchallenged number one, or at least many Americans no longer perceive the United States as the lone hyperpower without peer competitors. Large sections of the U.S. population realize that many of their leaders seem un realize what many of their le leaders seem unable to accept. That even if the United States remains the strongest global power, and there are good reasons to believe it will, Washington will be unable to exercise the influence it once enjoyed. Put simply, the American era is over, and Washington must devise a new grand strategy to deal with that situation. And I think we see the two terms of Obama as both an attempt to develop a strategy, but also the complexity and the failures in that. The, ter the first term of Trump, and there could well be a second, is, oh, have I, got, I missed the slide, there you go. Um, <laughs> and just in case, uh, so uh, the, the, the first term of Trump is a much more ad hoc ideological attempt to deal with that perception but at least from Trump and Bannon's side, from the fantasy of a transactional withdrawal from the world economy. And I think from the McMaster and the so-called axis of adult side, an attempt to inject a new realism at the limits into that. But then when we come to the Middle East, we see that transactional shifting alliances have actually caused greater instability, have empowered Saudi Arabia and the United Arab Emirates to pick on GATA for no good reason that I can see. And it's also destabilized the one success of the Obama administration in the Middle East, the Iran nuclear deal, which had, I think, undeniably stopped Iran moving towards proliferation, had taken the nuclear worry off the table, and is now going to put that and Iran's role at the center of instability in the region back centrally on the table. And it seems that the US government has no solutions to dealing with that. Thank you very much. Thank you, Toby, and perfect timing. So we've got plenty of time for questions and discussion. Um, something I forgot to mention earlier, if you want to tweet about this event, uh, the hashtag is LSE Trump. Um, in terms of the Q&A, if you can just stick to, to one question, um, just to ensure that we draw in as many people into discussion as possible, and obviously don't get into extended commentary on uh, Toby's uh, uh, presentation, I'll try and keep Toby to concise answers as well. You can also, uh, you know, when you do your question, introduce yourself and any affiliation that you may have. So, well, you want to take sort of two or three, and then we'll just... Up to you. That you're way. Okay. Okay, so we've got right over there. Yep. Yeah, we're going to use a mic, so just wait for the mic. Thanks. So, okay. Uh, You're live. All right. Okay. Uh, I'm Fadi Esper. I'm a PhD student at the RSE's Department of uh, <coughs> International History. Um, th my question is, uh, how does this analysis of Trump and his foreign policy fit into a changing uh, regional environment in the Middle East. I mean, now, for the first time since the uh, 1970s, uh, mid-1970s, we have this uh, Russian presence in the region, both, uh, both uh, diplomatic and military. So how does that, this policy fit into that whole picture? And on the regional powers, I mean, you've covered Iran, but how about Turkey? Turkey is proving a very mm -hmm. uh, troublesome uh, country for the United States. Uh, it is deploying uh, Russian-made air defenses, and as a NATO country, that's almost a precedent. And it's cutting deals in Syria and Iraq uh, that um, work against uh, U.S. interests. And just a quick... Okay, that's okay. it. Okay, you, there's enough there, and when we move on to someone else, you can come back, yeah? So, um, over there with the kind of the purpley scarf and spectacles, yeah? And then we'll come to you afterwards, yeah? That'll be the first three. 
Thank you. Um, Kavita Kopas, um, no affiliation. Um, could you comment, um, if it doesn't cause too much trouble, on the economic dynamic between Canada and America and complications that arise from Canadian economic interests in the Middle East, which might clash with America's? Do you want to give me a specific example? Um, I'm thinking of Canico I th in particular. I think that's a Canadian company, but I'm, I'm not sure. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Paul Dupuis and I'm in the MSc in IR uh, at LSE and uh, just joined the uh, FPA class. Of Congratulations. Digital. Thank you very much. <laughs> um, so ma maybe um, a few months ago you also read uh, an article in the New York Times about um, how uh, less informed uh, Trump was compared to um, um, Barack Obama. Uh, because it didn't like to read uh, and didn't read policy briefs and policy reports and intelligence briefs and ask for uh, less text and more images. Um, I wanted to know how uh, that may be uh, a less qu lower quality of information uh, is impacting uh, Trump's foreign policy and if, that, if that's a, a concern. Yeah, okay. Thank you. Thank you. Over to you, Toby. Okay, right. Um, I think there were, there were uh, three questions from our, our bold question answer up there, and he got away with it, so yep. uh, I don't yep. know what's going on with the chairing. But, um, <laughs> <laughs> well, you can decide to answer one. Uh, no, no, I, I'll, I'll, yeah. I'll, I'm struggling with the Canada one, so I'll, I'll answer these three. Um, <laughs> I suppose if, I would, if I were trying to, to think about the change or region, changing regional environment, I'd put it in, in maybe three different aspects. Firstly, the aftermath of the Arab Spring where state legitimacy, state coherence is up for grabs. It collapse in Libya, obviously driven by the failed intervention, collapse in Syria, collapse in some regeneration in, in Iraq. Um, so you, you, you have instability and fear. You, you have then, under Obama, in an attempt to deal with America's uh, post-2008 shrinking position but long-term decline, to try and limit... Um, limit uh, America's involvement just as the Arab Spring uh, uh, ex uh, explodes. And, then, and uh, so you have the outcomes of both of that, state weakness and a reduced American p uh, presence. Two things happen, I think. We could take Turkey, we could take the United Arab Emirates, and then much latterly Saudi Arabia under uh, the Crown Prince as starting to operate somewhat within their own gravitational pull, to use a metaphor, that as America's ambition reduced or then under Trump has become much more transactional, they've taken the space to assert themselves with absolutely cat catastrophic uh, effects. The intervention in Yemen is a disaster, um, and with, with the, the further collapse, collapse of Yemen, with huge human suffering and no end in sight, a strategic miscalculation of huge consequences. I would argue on a much less scale the attempt to coerce uh, the Gatter to, to some form of uh, conformity is also uh, an example of, uh, of, of, of a failure to do proper risk assessment and to, to, to work out your levers of power and how they work, and a classic 101 foreign policy mistake. And I suspect we'll see a few more. Internal uh, economic reform in Saudi Arabia doesn't exactly fill me with optimism either, given the lack of institutional capacity, so we have that. Secondly, we have the moving in of other states. Now, in a book I edited not so long ago, in 2015, I think, uh, one of the chapters, I think, strongly argued that Russia's presence in the region, along with China's, was transactional and economic mainly, with one glaring exception, the exception is Syria. Now, the Syrian intervention, you could argue, was the Russian-Syrian intervention was, in, in, in its first instance, created by... Uh, created by indecisive American policy. They didn't, Obama, I think quite right, he was uh, seeking to keep out, but also then uh, driven by what the Russians believed was the bad faith of the, res the UN resolution around Libya. Basically, we will draw a line and we won't let this happen again, especially to an ally. So the, the, the muscular intervention to bolster Assad, to save him, because the regime was on the verge of collapse, and then... To, to bolster, I think, is an example of 
the 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 the, the, un, the backlash against the Libyan resolution, but also a sense that they could get away with it, that America was operating in a lacuna. Turkey Turkey is, is amazing, I think, in, not in a good sense. I think that you. You, you know, who remembers zero problems with the neighbours? Who remembers uh, the, the, the attempted uh, peace deal with the PKK? We have something... Who, who remembers that the heady days when Tur Turkey was unproblematically described as a democracy? We see almost a back-to-the-future moment of a, uh, a, 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 the personalisation of an authoritarian regime centralising power and using military coercion and repression to hold on to power. Now, you could argue that's been a long time coming. The signs have been there. This is a, an, an, an upswing of a policy that's been heralded for a long time that the United States and the international community did precious little to constrain. Now, you could argue if, the, if Mogherini was here or any representative in the EU, they'd say, oh, with the Syria crisis, the, um, the deal we needed to do to, 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 on Syrian refugees was a pragmatic, short-term deal that won't stand up and was clearly to the, uh, the detriment of, of EU, uh, EU foreign policy making and its ability to influence Turkish politics. And I do, do, it begs the question, is Turkey's role in the region sustainable? No, I suspect. Is, Turkey's, is the AKP and Erdogan's rule in Turkey over the medium, medium term sustainable? Rather worryingly, probably yes. So I think that places uh, key issues, Russia and Syria, to some extent uh, Turkey's, Turkish meddling inconsistently in, in Syria, but um, more consistently in Iraq, against a background of Obama's attempt to minimize American exposure and Trump's incoherence. But I would foreground much more centrally internal domestic dynamics. Now, because Trump has a, a weak grip on the truth, I shall outflank him and be very truthful and say I can't answer your question on Canada and America. I was thinking while I was answering there about bluffing it, but I won't. Uh, I just what's, say sorry. What's, what's your sense of it? You asked the question. You don't even get, Toby hasn't answered. What's your sense of it? Um, why, why is it important? You know, why have you asked it? And that there are, like the financial sector, the mining sector is, and the uranium enrichment sector are international projects. They don't respect any national boundaries and they're not interested in any regional power play other than where they can um, gain more, more profits or, or sell their wares. Um, I'm not, I don't, I don't know in detail enough about the Canadian companies that are operating, but I know that they're, I know enough that their their interests are not always in parallel or in tandem with the US interests, and in some respects maybe more closely aligned to Russia's interests, for example, or China's. I think that's what's intriguing about transactional politics, America first, that basically if you are encouraging, if you're encouraging states to deal with you on a short-term interest-driven basis, that there is actually, if you take it to its logical conclusion, there, are, there is no US-guaranteed framework to stabilize their long-term interactions, then that's bound to have that effect, that Canada, other states, Saudi Arabia, whatever it is in the region, are, are bound to take short-term decisions, make short-term policies, because long-term partnership or indeed retribution, in theory, isn't deliverable. So the kind of hemorrhaging, the fracturing of this post uh, Second World War order um, seems to be almost a logical and recognisable outcome of Trump's celebration of transactional politics. The question on Trump not reading his briefs, I have two thoughts on that. Firstly, the last president who was notoriously incurious was George Bush Jr., that was swayed by big ideas, bright colours, big sloganeering, and we saw where that got. Now, in, in the Trump administration up until the late summer, you had two sets of very big ideas that I tried to indicate. Oh, no. no um, and he tried to indicate here. And Bannon on one side and then the, the, the military on the other were in a fairly vicious war with Bannon 
quite transparency leaking falsehoods about McMaster, uh, less so about matters. And of course, then Kelly coming to, um, to, to become White House Chief of Staff, remove Bannon and stop that. Now, what are we left with? The, the example I know is on the fringes of the Middle East, which is uh, McMaster's uh, policy rethink on Afghanistan. So to begin with, there was a, a, a huge fight between Bannon, who backed Trump's pledge just to pull out of Afghanistan, and McMaster, who spent uh, you know, uh, uh, maybe 30% of his adult army career in Afghanistan, saying, no, it's much more complex than that, not a good thing to say to Trump. No, 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 there are bigger things at issue. So apparently, he got Trump's attention by showing pictures of 1960s Kabul, where women were dressed in miniskirts uh, as, a, as a symbol of a modern, forward-leaning, Trump-like society that Afghanistan could return to. Now, this is a fairly well-substantiated, um, I wouldn't call it fact, but tale from the White House. And so you have, and this is after um, a documented uh, screaming fit where Trump shouted at McMaster, told him to take his policy away because it was too complex and it wasn't radical enough. So what does he bring back? Pictures, photographs. So you have a president who had deliberately set up two different wings of his own foreign policy making. Uh, uh, because of the failure and incoherence, Kelly sheared away one of those and, and threw it out of the White House. Still influential, I think, Bannon, but not a policy maker, not got the capacity to leak with that effect. And so now you have this so-called access of adults, militarization, senior military men, driving policy forward on Afghanistan, I think on Iran to a certain extent, that they've persuaded Trump to back, but that no great sustain, as far as I can see, risk assessment has been put in place. What happens when we abrogate the Iran nuclear deal? What does that do? Or what happens when we sell as much weapons as Saudi Arabia can buy? Reminiscent of another country in 19, before 1979, I would have suggested. What happens then? No one seems to have been put in place the risk mediation and the long-term strategic thinking to answer those questions. That's what happens when you get an incurious president who makes policy by looking at pictures. Okay, thank you, Toby. So you've got a chap there in the kind of green uh, top, yeah? That's you? Yep. yep. Okay, okay. And we've got three. So we we'll take another three, yeah? Hello. Yeah. Um, over here. Yusuf, no affiliation. Um, my question is, what do you think of the new um, alliance in the Middle East between Israel and the Gulf states? What's the potential there for stability in the region and the peace process? And shouldn't we view that as a, an achievement on the part of Trump's foreign policy? Okay. Good. Oh, just here. Yeah, and the great top. Hi. Uh, Tess, no affiliation. I had a similar question about uh, Trump's foreign policy on Israel and Palestine. So what, what's uh, your question? On Trump's foreign policy on um, Israel and Palestine, so if you could maybe comment sure. on that. As okay, well. we'll get another question because they're two of the yeah. same question. Okay, so the chap with the tie then, the pink shirt, and then we'll get Chris. Oh, yeah. We should have um, another two rounds, any two rounds of questions if Toby can keep his comments concise, responses concise, yeah? Uh, sure. No one pressure. Round, one um, so Duncan McPherson, Lloyds Banking Group. Um, so, assuming that Trump doesn't get a second term in office, do you think his successor, is it plausible to think that his successor could potentially address some of these issues that you've touched mm. upon this evening, or has the damage already been done? We've got Chris here, Chris Phillips. Thanks, I'm Chris Phillips, Queen Mary um, as well. Uh, Similar question to the, to the Israel questions, but I'm, I'm just almost from the US policy side of things. Um, how much in your research, Toby, uh, do you buy into the notion that um, the, the tails wagging the dog in the sense of sort of uh, both Saudi and Israel are greatly influencing Trump's decision making with regard to Iran in the sense that it, if it, it strikes me that he seems to have literally bought hook, line and sinker like, you know, policy off the shelf uh, that greatly echoes both what Riyadh and uh, Tel Aviv, Jerusalem are, are, are saying, and, and in which case, it, 
I was wondering what you thought the role of Jared Kushner was in that, because he seems very close to Mahmoud bin Salman. He's obviously sort of got links to Bibi Netanyahu. And for a president, as you say, that's not really that interested in, in complex ideas, for you know a fourth, perhaps, ideologue in your, in your group to be there promoting a certain cardboard cutout view of uh, of Iran and its role in the w I in the region. I'm wondering whether that fits in with your analysis or not. So you four questions, two kind of same on Israel and yeah. Right. I, I, let me. I, I thought Israel might come up, so I made some notes. Um, <laughs> so like every U.S. president since Harry Truman has sought peace between Israel and its Arab neighbours. Huh? Every president since Lyndon Johnson has opposed the building of Jewish settlements on land that Israel occupied in June 67 and supported a diplomatic solution. Every president since Bill Clinton has worked for a two-state solution under which Israel would enjoy security and genuine acceptance in the Middle East and the Palestinians would run their own affairs. However, Donald Trump has put these central tenets of policy in doubt. I think you could argue Trump's p p policy is potentially revolutionary. In his coldness towards the vision of a Palestinian state and his indifference to the problem of settlements, he has aligned himself, he seems to have aligned himself with Israel's right wing, uh, with his victory giving that camp the hope that the dreams of absorbing the Palestinian territories into Israel could just be fulfilled without being encumbered by US policy. So no pressure for compromise or peace. Notably, Trump chose his personal bankruptcy lawyer, a man who must have had a lot of work from him, David Friedman, for the post of US ambassador to Israel. As we know, Friedman has close ties to the Israeli settler movement. Now, is that Kushner or is that, is that Kushner or is that Trump? I'd say that was Trump, actually, and I would say that's come out of his campaigning because he, he wobbled on Israel during the campaign and it's come out of a, a, kind, a, a kind of world vision. However, that is balanced with James Mattis again warning that giving up a two-state solution would mean Israel ceases to be a Jewish state or, you, or Arabs don't get the vote. That's apartheid. That's a direct quote. Uh, and then Trump started to speak along with Kushner as the uh, Israel-Palestinian agreement as the ultimate deal. He visited Israel and met with Palestinian leaders on his first foreign trip in May 2017, encouraging Israel to be responsive to the Arab states and then join this alliance. So where are we? Where are we on Trump's Israel policy, uh, Israel-Palestine policy? I think Trump's worldview aligns himself to Netanyahu, aligns himself to that kind of, again, bright-colored, moralistic, rather simplistic argument. I think there's, there's little doubt about that. But as with every other uh, campaign, person campaigning for president and then winning, he hasn't moved on the, the, the oft-repeated promise of moving the embassy to Jerusalem because I think he's taken advice that this would be as complex and as troublesome for his allies in Israel as it would be for the Palestinians, let alone US policy. So complexity creeps in. But I think what all this lends me to, to, to um, suggest is that Israel-Palestine peace won't be a major uh, goal. It won't, be, it won't get the investment of the president. It won't get the investment of what's left of the State Department and the new Secretary of State after Tillotson. It will just drift, which is probably exactly what Netanyahu want, because there's no scrutiny, there's no pressure to settle, there's no uh, pressure to deal with the settlements, which are clearly the major uh, break on peace. On um, Saudi, Israel and Iran, well, as you know, in the election campaign, he damned the Iranian deal repeatedly. And the Iranian deal was you know, the worst ever. I would never have done that. And as Obama's signature uh, success in the Middle East, um, uh, it, it became a kind of talisman of his anti-Obamaism. M my own sense of his relations with the Gulf states before taking power, beyond the Emirati ambassador's weekly lunches with Krishna was fairly minimal. So I think the idea that he bought it hook, line, and sinker beyond his own inclinations, I think, is, is probably not sustainable. I think it sat as a central talisman against, with his attack on, on Obama. And then if you look at his, you know, his two of his three chief advisors, they're on record for long being skeptical about the Iran deal. And what will be announced tomorrow, he says with great confidence, um, will be 
placing centrally a containment policy towards Iran's uh, militia allies, especially Hezbollah, but uh, the, 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 the Iranian-backed uh, wing of the Hashishabi in Iraq, and it will be an attempt to roll back Iranian influence. And I think that hasn't, although that will marry n neatly with Israeli and Saudi and wider Gulf Arab interests, that's been developed in the National Security Council and in the Pentagon. It's not been developed in Riyadh, uh, Tel Aviv, or Abu Dhabi. Any response to Duncan's questions about what happens? At, who clears up the mess? Or ah, that's a great question. Sorry, I forgot that. Um, second page of notes. Right, so from that point of view, I think it, if, I'm, if I'm right, and this is, this is a, a, about a structural transformation of the international system, with America's preeminence coming increasing under question, first economically, and then somewhere long down the line, uh, strategically, then you have an Obama-like response, which is to an a failed attempt to, to draft a US strategy, you know, the very definition of a, a, a strategy is say, right, what are our, what are our resources in a rationalist way, and what are our central prioritized aims? Now, Obama tried to do that, and of course the Arab Spring in the Middle East got in the way. The, 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 the infamous pivot to China never quite happened because the Middle East had a way of coming back and dragging American policy back in. Trump's at attempt at transactional politics is another way of prioritizing America first, money, deals, investment in American failing industry over long-term strategic commitments to an international stability. That's already failing, I think. Can someone clear up the mess? What would that look like? That would, I think, look like a, an attempt to decouple America's strategic interests from America's sense of itself, its own, its own ideational self-branding, its idealism or whatever. Now, ironically, that's exactly the manoeuvre that Bannon was trying to make. If you, if you can get, and there's no reason why you should, if you can get beyond the overt, overt racism and see what Bannon was trying to do, what Bannon was trying to do beyond that is to try and reduce America's engagement with the world and group, uh, reduce America's investment in a global order. Uh, and he got kicked out because of that after fighting a failed struggle against McMaster and Mattis, who clearly want that investment in global <coughs> order. So both Obama and Bannon have identified a problem and come up with different solutions, both of which haven't worked, uh, a recalibrate, a, a, re a, a right sizing of America's position in the world to match its, eco its declining economic dominance. It's clearly what both were trying to struggle towards. Is that possible? Well, we've been here before, haven't we? I mean, repeated. The, the, the repeated kind of crisis of American of Germany and American power, and the US doesn't. But it's I think this ability to, you know, address it and move on and. Well, it, it, certainly under Clinton it did, and under Reagan it did. But uh, but, but those uh, those short-term palliatives, if, if if the technological jump, don't seem to be that personified of Silicon Valley. Don't <coughs> seem to be around the next corner. I don't see what. But who's going to who's going to provide the non-transactional form of politics to actually construct construct well, I wonder, order? I, I mean, wonder if anyone will. Yeah. I mean, that, that's the argument. It's a huge cost that America took to its own advantage, as, as, as you've written on very well after after the first, took it, took it on after the Second World War, but partly because it saw its own position as challenged by a rival during the Cold War. Things become much more interesting and much more difficult when that kind of bipolar world ends. Okay. Okay. Thanks, Toby. So we've got a question up there. Person in blonde hair and blue shirt, and then we'll, yeah, and then there's, any others? Hey. Yeah. Uh, okay, I think chap over there, the, there's your the third question, yeah. Okay. The blonde hair. I'm America Fay, PhD student at the Institute of Arab Islamic Studies at the University of Exeter. I was wondering whether you could expand a little bit more on the impact of uh, Trump uh, foreign policy and the sectarian strife in the region, not no. only for what concerns Iraq and Syria, but also Bahrain? Yeah, I think that... Thank you. Oh, okay. So sectarianism, Trump's foreign policy, and yeah. just on the front here. Um, 
Hi, um, thank you for your um, presentation. It was quite insightful. Um, I'm Hassan Fruzan, um, independent postdoc scholar. I was just, um, I had a question about the term militarization that you have used because it's a, um, a process that has been ongoing for some time. I mean, the first time that I heard the term was during the Bush administration hmm. and it's um, resort to um, unilateralism. I just want to know the um, different sort of militarization that is taking place under mm -hmm. you know, current administration and um, you know, how does it differ with Bush administration beyond you know, expansion of, uh, for example, uh, military budget and giving powers to pentagons or arming you know, um, Gulf states. And the other question okay, that... that's fine, that's fine. Okay. You'll bring some other people in, because you might get to get too... So you've got in the sort of, I don't know, pink stripy shirt with a, your hand up there. Yeah. Is that pink? I can't, I can't. Pinkish. <laughs> pink, grey. It's checked, actually, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> Hi, I'm uh, Mark Boland. I work for Bloomberg. So uh, talking about transactional diplomacy, do you think, or is it your opinion that the Saudis got what they what they wanted from the big Asian trip uh, earlier this year, and also I can't remember there was some Saudi person visiting Moscow more recently, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. Yeah. That's it for now. So you just yeah, yeah. Secretary, it, it, it yes would be the, the answer, but we have to be a bit more detailed than that even out of this chair. Um, so from that point of view. What, what's Trump doing in the region? What's that big takeaway from Riyadh? Is he's empowering the alliance with, Ab with the United Arab Emirates and Saudi Arabia at its center to counter and fight Iran, basically. And then tomorrow we'll see where the Americans' policy fits into that and goes beyond it, I would have thought. Now, how, they, how have they done that? How's, how's this conflict played out? And certainly since the, the, the regime change in Iraq in 2003, it's played out in a heightened instrumental use of sectarian rhetoric as a tool of foreign policy. So it's, it's been there since 79, but you've seen it much more powerfully used. You undermine your rivals or you attempt to undermine your rivals through exacerbating splits within societies at the same time as those splits are being... Uh, exacerbated by a weakness of those states themselves with low oil prices, or, to be frank, cataclysmically stupid policies that undermine national citizenship and exacerbate feelings of alienation within, within the national community. Trump comes along, and in recognising, giving his blessing to, and by doing so accelerating the regional Cold War, he cannot but accelerate those policies and see... Uh, so he ignores... The faulty domestic policies in in Saudi and Bahrain, uh, and then gives the blessing for the uh, for the export of, of sectarian ideology. That that undoubtedly is going to increase the the, the scope with which sectarian rhetoric is going to be used. Now, quite interestingly, in Iraq and Syria, how does American policy avoid demonising militias that are aligned with Iran um, in sectarian terms? Okay, well, let's watch the speech closely tomorrow if it happens and how he delineates from a group... Uh, so maybe there's 52 separate militias in the Hashishabi in Iraq, how he delineates between those that are good in the American policy, either aligned uh, to um, uh, the Hausa or uh, the Iraqi government and those that are bad because they're aligned with... Iran, good luck with that. I think it's going to be difficult in a short speech or a policy document, if not impossible, in real life. So that's, that's the second tier of that problem. How he, uh, Implicitly, he's given his blessing to a regional Cold War that's largely sectarian in rhetoric. Explicitly, is he going to avoid overtly demonizing the militias aligned to Iraq, Iran in sectarian terms? I think it's going to be tricky to do that. What does militarization mean? Well, you've got Bush, Obama, uh, Trump. Uh, the term was used under Bush, certainly, and the, the kind of crusading neo uh, uh, 
conservatism personified by the use of military force in Iraq. But that I think the crucial thing that military force was wielded largely by civilians and infamously in the Department of Defense by civilians who'd not seen shots fired in anger with the exception of uh, the Secretary of Defense under, under Bush. Uh, we come to Obama and the, the example I know best is the struggle over Afghan policy. So Petraeus won the first round and then the military was removed from Afghan policy making in the second round. So the military is put back in their box. The military is out of their box and centrally driving policy. A serving military officer with, a, officer with H.R. McMaster, a retired officer with Kelly and Mattis. So I think I said what Trump has done for the reasons I tried to outline is give the space for the military not only to make military policy but to make and to wield military power. The loosening of control over the Pentagon of deployment, expansion, enlargement of troop forces abroad, I think, is, 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 uh, is unprecedented. So I think what you're seeing is the military taking uh, a central role. Is that a, a complete transformation of American and US foreign policy? No, I think, uh, as we got back to the question before, a new president with a better grip on the policy-making process, with, with a, 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 a more attention to detail, will not need to delegate, won't delegate, will refuse to delegate. But what about the deployment of, of actual forces on the ground? Well, what, the first thing he did in, in Iraq and Afghanistan was to loosen the ability of the commander on the ground to ask for more troops without going back to the White House. There's that. This is, this is special forces rather than expeditionary warfare, right? That's the, anyway, is that... Is that it's not again? A, give me a definition of special forces when the numbers in, in Afghanistan and Iraq are so large. I think that definition of special forces okay, well, breaks down. Okay, congressional, well, congressional sort of authorization, right? Appropriations, I mean... That, uh, by, the, by the very nature of giving increased autonomy to, to combat commanders on the ground to increase troop numbers, you're circumventing Congress. You're undermining or constraining <laughs> con congressional oversight until they come forward, until they reassert. And I think what's absolutely fascinating about um, decertifying Iran is you're actually now giving foreign policy agency decision making capacity to Congress do you congressional uh, uh, leaders want to vote for greater sanctions it's completely up to you if we're right on what happens tomorrow or the few, next day not over the next four days but then of course as he gives with our land he's sending his national security advisor his secretary of defense into Congress oh no please don't do that it's not part of our strategy I mean, it's absolutely bizarre. It's a bizarre way to make policy. And if you were and it being... it plays the base. It, it, well, does the base worry about Iranian policy in the Gulf? I really don't think it does. And I think that's where Bannon mm -hmm. was fighting, saying mm -hmm. the base doesn't give a damn about the Middle East as long as the Middle East stays in the Middle East. Mm -hmm. The base gives a damn if the <laughs> Middle East comes to, to America. So that's, that's, I think, the issue. So there was another, there was another question, wasn't there? Well, I think in terms of uh, Saudi, China. China. Yeah, and and Saudi and the Saudi and the yeah. Saudi desire uh, and stated desire to buy uh, wep uh, Russian weapons. I think air, air defence system. The Gulf states, the Arab Gulf states, are consumers of external security. And certainly under the Obama administration, what they did was go out and buy a lot of kit they didn't need from Britain and from France in order to secure secondary providers of security. In fact, you could argue the conservative government's Gulf policy is simply that, to sell as much military kit to uh, the Gulf states in the lacuna of unpopularity that Obama caused for American role in the Gulf. Now, that's over. Trump said anything you want, so we'll see what the conservative Gulf policy tax to next but in that sense the transactional basis you buy stuff from us and we'll give you security oh but I can buy stuff from them as well in spite that I'm vociferously on the other side of their fight mm. in Syria mm. so I'll buy a weapons system from them because I'll spread my bets mm. but the US is actively encouraging me to do that because what it's selling beyond its weapons is a transactional politics so again it gets back to if you disinvest from post-45 long-term investment in multilateral security guarantees, then what you're doing is creating the space for others to invest in, in bilateral security guarantees. And that's clearly what's happening in the Saudi trip to, to, to both Asia, but more importantly to Russia. Thank you. Got a couple more questions. A couple of people have had their hands raised up. I think there's a 
person in a grey sweater and a person here in a brown shirt. So we can take those two. And we'll there's, just get, there's a um, final question down here as well, I think, from okay. Professor Ansari or something. But you're having dinner with him afterwards, uh, so, okay. Um, person with the uh, check shirt, give me the third one. Okay, that's it. So, yeah, person over there, yeah. Hi, I'm Gabriel. I'm a student in the International Political Economy Masters. Uh, coming back to the U.S. and Israel policy and this grand coalition of Israel and mm. Saudi Arabia against Iran, do you think we're m like Israel and uh, Saudi Arabia deals have essentially happened behind closed doors? Mm. But do you think we will move forward a formal and official recognition of Israel as a Jewish state by Gulf countries in exchange of moving forward the peace process with the Palestinians? And how does Trump can intervene in all that? Right. Okay. Yeah. So, um, go on, just go. We're running out of time, so yeah. just carry on. Yeah. Lucas, as Ciao. the alumnus, um, so my question is: We're talking about transactional politics here, versus maybe long-term strategic view politics. Assuming that one would be more destabilizing than the other. Ah. Namely, transactional politics mm. would be more destabilizing than long-term strategic view politics. Is that truly so? And maybe I can see that it's so in the short term. But is it so in the long term? I wonder. Right. Got a fan of Trump here. Thank you. Right. Okay. And the last up there uh, in the Donald check shirt. Okay, but no affiliation. Just alluding to the Israeli-Saudi connection, which you've referred to. Uh, do we know the extent of discussions to date between Israel and Saudi Arabia? Okay, right. You've got five minutes, Sobi. Okay, so let, let's deal, because I didn't answer the, I've got about six minutes, because I didn't answer that the, fully the question on Israel-Gulf uh, relations before. I mean, the, the deal is on the table and has been since King, King Abdullah. The Abdullah plan was that if there's a viable if Israel pulls out and, and leaves a viable state in what were the what would have been the occupied territories sixty seven, then they will recognise Israel as 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 a state. That's been on the on on the books for a long time, um, so that's there. The, the simple answer: Will Saudi and the UAE recognise Israel? No, they won't. The de the relationship that the UAE has got with Israel is 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 very close in security cooperation. Uh, there are un acknowledged flights that go before, go between, uh, I think, Dubai, Abu Dhabi, and, and Israel most weeks. But it's never recognized because of public opinion. And if you think public opinion in the United Arab Emirates, think of public opinion in Saudi Arabia, which would be, we assume, and I think it's a strong assumption, outraged by any type of recognition. So what we were more likely to move towards is not overt recognition, but covert interaction. Which brings us to your question. Interaction between the UAE and Israel has been well documented over the last decade, maybe seven years at least. Uh, interaction with Saudi and Israel is track two, which means it's generally retired military people, people close to the regime in Riyadh. And it's, it, 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 to some extent, it's been over the last maybe four years, five years, I'd like to say, and has, to some extent, plausible deniability, not great extent. Um, and it's it's about negotiations. Now, what tr it's about confidence building, trying to work out plausibly what would be uh, the, the basis to some form of informal alliance. And of course, interactions between Doha and Tel Aviv were the most advanced of all for a long period of time. Israel had a trade office there for a long time. So from that, and it still has a virtual trade office, whatever that is. So from that point of view. Saudi is the last to come on board, at, but it's tentative because of public opinion, and, and I don't think it'll, there won't be any major breakthrough. What Trump was attempting to do, I think, uh, was recognize that and trying to push it forward in this kind of alliance of all American allies against Iran. I don't think that will work. I think it will be tentative more than anything else. On the transactional question versus is, is transactional politics... I would argue that transactional politics by its very nature has to be short term uh, and that the H.R. McMaster op-ed in, in the Wall Street Journal recognised that, I suspect, or I might be reading too much into it. And by its short-termism and its, its 
contract, short-term contractual basis, it's going to be until the next. So you go buy uh, weapon systems from Moscow if you're Saudi Arabia because you're not sure about the long-term stability of you buying weapons just from one source. So that's good for pe merchants of death, but probably not very good for kind of certainty moving forward or strategic planning, I would have thought. Now, the counter-argument to that would be Britain's withdrawal from Suez in 67, so you had no regional hegemon, and but you had uh, the longest period of uh, peace till 79, I think, if, if my history isn't failing me, in the Gulf. So without a hegemon, you had some peace. But the counter-argument the counter -argument there is because of uh, the expanding oil revenues, all those states were internally trying to state building, and of course that... Uh, the incompetence of one of that, those leaders, Shah of Iran, and his massive arms purchases and on and on, urban, uh, uncontrolled urbanization, inflation, whatever, led to the Iranian revolution at the end of that period, and indeed the increasing intervention of the hegemon, the United States in the region. Now, the, 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 under Obama, it, 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 it was quite amusing that senior State Department and Defense Department people would fly into the Gulf where they'd be richly attacked for the US leaving, and depending on what office they were in the Gulf as they were being attacked, they'd point to the Fifth Fleet and say, but it hasn't left. So what was going on there? What was going on there was the security consumers' fear, quite justifiable, that Obama clearly did want to downscale, and then them reacting against that. Uh, so a recalibration we were talking about earlier. So I think transactional politics, by their very nature, are more unstable, but I wouldn't want to overstress the United States as the deliverer par excellence of stability because the Gulf, even under increasing American hegemony from 79 onwards, would be a hell of an unstable place. Now, if you wanted to give the counter argument, ah, oh, that, yes, that's right, and George W. Bush tried to, tried to nip the bud of that instability by invading Iraq and look where that got us. So the US isn't necessarily a provider of stability even in long-term investment of, uh, of, of kind of uh, predictable structures, but the alternative is almost certain to guarantee you instability. There, yeah, I got there in the end. Okay. Okay, I think that's it. So, um, if we can just thank Toby and and thank you for your contributions. <laughs>